how many of us have gone through what I'm about to say here? I would think everybody, but how many of us have uh, done this? You sin, you repent, and you confess, and then you proceed to beat yourself silly for the next few days with guilt and all sorts of spiritual despair because you sin. And then after a week or so, you sin again. And then you repent and confess and you beat yourself up again for a few more days with guilt and all sorts of spiritual despair. And for the sake of time, just repeat what I said a few hundred times. (laughs) Because, you know, that's what I'm trying to illustrate. Every single Christian, especially babes in Christ. In other words, every single person that's a threat to Satan, that's what we go through. But no more. Enough already. I mean, Satan does this to all of us, and it simply needs to stop. It's like being on a spiritual roller coaster, like I was talking about at the camp meeting a couple of weeks ago. One day, all is well, and you're flying high above the clouds in faith and obedience. And then the next day, you do something stupid, and no matter how much you confess it, you simply can't get that stupid, weak act of sin out of your mind, and you feel like the scum of the earth all over again, wherein you no longer are flying high above the clouds. Instead, now you feel you're well underneath the clouds, on the dirt in the, in the earth, rolling around in the evil bowels of the sin-sick world in utter despair. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 5 and 6 says this, By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation... He had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In other words, you are not pleasing God in the least when you mope around in despair After you've already confessed the sin, he stated in his word that he forgave you and all is well, but your despair proves you just plain don't believe his word. In fact, it proves you believe the lie that Satan sent and said, and that's what the devil's going for. I mean, Satan does this to get us into a place of despair where when we feel unworthy to pray. We can't pray for ourselves or even any anybody else that the Lord sends our way when they ask us to pray for them. He does this for many reasons. For example, he does this to get you off the, uh, to get you to put off, say, being baptized when you have the chance, and he does this to prevent us from sharing the gospel message or the present truth for our day to those the Lord sends our way because our spiritual despair makes us feel like we can't be used of God in any way, shape, or form, and therefore unable to speak biblical truths, and so we don't. Because we just committed the sin a couple, three days ago. We're still moping around thinking that we're scum of the earth and we can't be used of God. All of us went through this as young Christians. And so we can warn the young believers among us to expect it and how to avoid it. But I'm sad to say that many of us still deal with this beating ourselves up scenario, even though we accepted Christ years or sometimes decades ago. I know I do, you know, on occasion, every now and then. But but the Lord keeps reminding me of this little thing that he shared with me many years ago and And so I want to share it today. I mean, Satan hates us. He fears us. And when we believe his lies over the truth as it is written by a God that cannot lie, we're letting the enemy of all souls actually dictate to us how we should think of ourselves and how we should walk as Christians. But that's the exact opposite of how the Word of God says we're supposed to walk. I mean, keep in mind, Satan loves to jump around in the playground of the flesh. He uses everything from simple lust to fear, to get us to do as he commands. But as Christians, we must walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Who cares what he's doing? Just tell him to shut up. I mean, the basic reality here is that one surefire way for the dying God of this world to be successful against God's people is to get us to focus on the flesh. In so doing, we'll be unable to hear the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. Because it's the spirit. It's not the flesh. And you guessed it. The best way to get us there and be able to hear the the Holy Spirit is to get us to stop reading our Bibles. 
I mean, people think, oh, you know, you're pushing it a little bit there, Nick. I mean, it's, you know, no, seriously. <laughs> Reading the Word of God is like sitting down and letting Jesus talk to you every morning or evening whenever you read it. He wrote it for a reason. I mean, he's never gilded his, any of the lilies that he spoke when he was walking around. When he was, uh, you never beat around the bush, better way of saying it, I guess. He puts the truth out there the way it should be. He doesn't lie. He doesn't have to. He doesn't. He would never do it anyway. But even here, Satan wins when his despair moves God's people to put down their Bibles because he knows when we are reveling in the live despair, we feel unable to, or even worthy for that matter, for that uh, matter, uh, to, to to be given any wisdom from the Word of God. And so we put our Bibles down. Worse yet, if we stay in that awful place a little bit too long. Before long, we stop praying altogether as we should because, again, we feel unworthy and in such a state of spiritual gloom, we assume our, our loving Heavenly Father just won't hear our prayer, no matter how much we confess and repent, because when in the flesh, we have no choice but to trust Satan over Jesus when it comes to how our sins are forgiven, because that's what you're actually doing. But Romans 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Because the flesh is going to lie to you always. But the Holy Spirit won't do that. The best way to explain that verse in normal day-to-day -day reality is to declare, if your Bible says you are forgiven 100% for all your sins, because your Father in Heaven is all about love and not hate like Satan claims, then tell that dying God of dung to shut up and get back to walking in Christ as if you are a brand new Christian washed in the blood of the Lamb because that's exactly who you are every time you take Jesus at his word. And yes, some sin will you know, require spanking at times, but so what? Does it really matter if the Lord in heaven plans to spank you in the coming days since you know you're still going to heaven anyway? <laughs> I mean, do you care how big the spanking is if you're still going to make it home? It really doesn't matter. And, and no, this isn't me declaring we all have a license to sin. What I mean by spanking is, take, for example, the person that eats unclean foods or drinks harmful things, knowing full well they shouldn't be doing that. As a Christian, they are moved to repent, and so they eventually do quit. But the damage is done, let's say. Let's say they did it for 50 or 60 years. And so the damage is done. And even though they are forgiven and they will still make it home to heaven... They just might have to go to sleep a little sooner than most due to some sort of disease or cancer coming up from the, you know, the decades of defiling their temples, right? They're still going to make it home to heaven. They're just going to get there a little quicker than most. So does it matter if he's going to spank you anyway? The, the basic reality is even though they sinned in the past and they know the damage is done, they can still be very powerful workers for the Lord while they still walk this earth because they have been forgiven 100%. Not 99.9 .9 either, but 100. In fact, like many I've seen, have seen in my past, some will even use their disease as part of the testimony to get others to stop smoking or drinking or eating unclean foods. And all the while they are blessed by the Lord with absolute perfect forgiveness and he used them in mighty ways. And so even there, even if you're going to get the spanking, let's say the, you know, the trial comes upon you of some kind of disease, you can glorify God during that testimony. But if they allow Satan to make them feel they are useless now because the spanking is upon them, and especially you know, if, they're, if they're like, say, on their deathbeds, he wins by preventing them from going forth to glorify the Lord. Because you can still glorify the Lord even on, on, on a gurney. If we trust the Lord and his promises, our walks will not be marked with unhappiness and self-depreciation. You know, uh, we worship a heavenly father that loves us, not a tyrant that hates us. This is why Jesus said what he did in Luke chapter 11, verses 11 to 13, when he said, If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? I mean, it's pretty common sense, right? You're not going to do that. But look what Jesus says. He says, if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? I mean, all too often, the people of God are tempted to look at our heavenly Father the way Satan describes him. 
But notice how Jesus always called him Father. Is, is that not to say he will love us like a father does his own child on earth, but even more because his love is perfect and not skewed by a dying flesh as we all are, we all have as humans. That's why we are called evil or being wicked and sinful. I mean, how many of us have seen the video that showed the young man in the late 20s, I was talking about this last night, and he was being fed all that candy and harmful foods by his mother when he was a little boy because she loved him in a worldly manner and wanted to give him what he cried for. And sometimes just because she loved him, she would give him a cupcake or something, right? So the kid ends up getting overweight in, in his 20s, and he's literally dying of a heart attack because even though his mother did what she did out of love for him, and yes, sometimes just to shut him up, you know, because he didn't get enough cupcakes that day, let's say, it's what actually kills him later on. But our Heavenly Father loves us a lot more than that. His love sees far beyond such things. And so those of you that are new in the faith, when you cannot understand why your prayers are not answered regarding things you want that you truly think is best for you, your Father in Heaven knows the end from the beginning, and sometimes His answer to your prayer is a resounding no. He loves you enough to tell you the truth, even when you think it hurts. Later, when you look back after a few years of walking in his pure love and see that why he refused to give you what you wanted that day, and I've, I've, I've had this happen to me many times, you can then see how it would have destroyed you and your faith if he would have answered yes. And so instead of being upset with him when he says no, just thank him for his perfect will, because it says in James chapter 1, verse 17, that every good, uh, good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And, co and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So even when he says no, it's good for you. So say, thank you, Father. I didn't realize I was asking for the wrong thing, because we ask amiss, like it says in the Word. And so when you pray and can't understand why it takes so long for him to answer it, don't worry. Your Father truly knows what's best for you, and at the same time, this includes when you sin. Because quite frankly, even every one of us would just plain love it if after every time we sinned and then confessed and repented, if our Father would have placed a mile-long, well-lit banner in the sky saying you have been forgiven 100%, we would jump up for joy and get back to our work as Christians when we saw that banner every time we messed up. But because our Father doesn't do that, we are tempted by the enemy of souls to, to despair even after we repent. But the basic reality is, we do have that well-lit banner in the sky. It's called Scripture. And that and that says, we may go to Jesus and be cleansed and stand before the law that is etched in stone without any shame and any remorse because there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. So stop walking about after the flesh. You know, I, know, I know it's easier said than done, but when the Holy Spirit is within you, we all know how he leads us away from our sinful tendencies by reminding us when sin gets too close to us that we need to take heed lest we fall. So yes, the Lord does require that we confess our sins and humble our hearts before him. But as he has revealed to me and many of you and countless other obedient Christians all over the world, when we confess and repent, we need to trust him at his word. He's not a tyrant as Satan, the tempter suggests. We need to have spiritual confidence that our God is a loving and tender Father who will not forsake any of his children that put their trust in him. Many, many people even to this day walk by sight and not by faith because this is how it's been with all of us our entire lives. And so when we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, we're going to be tempted by his enemy to, not, to, to only believe the things that are seen in the world that we remember. And in so doing, we have a hard time trusting the precious promises given us from God's word because... It's not something you see in the world because the world doesn't have those kind of promises. The world is dying right before our eyes, in fact, whereas our God can't die, nor can his promises or his truth. And, and think about this as well. When we have trouble trusting his word and the promises regarding how we are forgiven, yet have no, trust, no trouble trusting the lies of Satan by agreeing with him to the point we despair and lose our faith, we dishonor our Heavenly Father in the most offensive way possible. Think about that. This might clear up or sober up some of us spiritually. I mean, seriously, think about that for a minute. Let that sink in a little deep. When we confess and repent, 
Why on earth do some of us go about thinking God looks at us as being useless when we already confess and repent? Did he not say if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness in 1 John 1, 9? I mean, Satan builds on that doubt to make us all sink in, the, in despair, just as he did with Peter when he walked on the water that day. I mean, just as Peter was reminded of how the world works and how the waves and the storms of his past worked in reality, because he was a fisherman, so he knew about the dangers of the ocean or that lake, we too are tempted to trust in what we saw in our past lives before meeting Jesus Christ. Satan does this because he knows it is the most offensive thing we can do against our Heavenly Father who stated in Micah chapter 7 verses 18 and 19, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity? Seriously, he's he's, he's forgiven you a stuff you knew was wrong to do. That's what iniquity means. I mean, who is a God like this? This is why Micah's saying this. And so, who is a God like unto thee that parteth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. Doesn't sound like a tyrant to me. It says he will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. And getting back to the sea, when Peter started sinking, did Jesus say, oh, well, <laughs> see ya. And let him drown? No. He delighteth in mercy. Peter cried out, Lord, help me. And he helped him. But when we despair, after confessing and repenting, that is, because you certainly have a reason to despair if you're in sin, but after you confess and repent, it's gone. It's in the sea of forgetfulness. It's in the depths of that sea. You can't even bring it up because the Lord's saying, well, what are you talking about? It's gone. But when we despair, we are openly declaring Satan's lies are more believable now. Over and above our Father's written promise in his word. And again, that has to be the most offensive thing that we as a remnant of the people of God can do to our Father. And think about this as well. We're in the very last days. We have already seen the attacks from hell. And they're increasing all around us. And so we know Satan is targeting us big time. Look what happened last night and today. Every time the Sabbath comes, something happens to this microphone. And then any time, any kind of work throughout the week, when I got to do something for the Lord, the enemy attacks in one way here or another way there. So we know he's targeting us, which also shows how weak he is. He's scared. (laughs) <laughs> that's why he flees. It doesn't say he walks away and just starts kicking pebbles and saunters off into the sunset when you say, get the end, Satan. It says he flees. He's that weak. we got to stop giving him too much credit. So we also know it was prophesied that the bride of Christ will go forth to proclaim a loud cry about God's law like we're doing now in the soon return of our Savior that we have been doing as well, that Satan plans to make as many as possible offend their creator by putting faith in his lies about how weak we are for sinning instead of how strong we are as forgiven children. Truth is, Satan is so weak, he does all he can to make us believe he is strong. And for most Christians today, it's working. Our father needs us to go forth ignoring all of Satan's lies. We can only stand in truth now. Because that is the reason for this war we find ourselves in in the first place. The great controversy between the truth of Christ and the lies of Satan have finally gotten to a point wherein people can actually see with their own eyes now rather easily how, um, as to whose side most people are on. You can see the fence out there now. And so Satan will flex his muscles against us in the coming days. And unless we are able to realize his lies to be just that, lies, and the truth, as it is written, is in fact truth, then we will fall with the rest of the lukewarm Christians. They're going to weep at the end of those thousand years. So common sense dictates that, yes, all of us are fallible. All of us make mistakes. And all of us fall into sin. But if we as believers in the Word of God are willing to see our sinfulness and allow the Holy Spirit to convict us into proper wholehearted confession and repentance, then we are guaranteed by the promise of a God that cannot lie to be completely restored into the grace of our God. And at that very moment, we are declared just as strong as any patriarch and prophet of old 
who also came to the same realization as to the bold differences between the lies of Satan and the truth of our Father. And yes, even after those that blessing is upon us, as we walk as strong Christians as any Christian can, our Father is still no respecter of persons. And so if in the near future we are to be spanked for whatever reason, it is good within our it is good with our soul, rather, that he allows us the spanking because being forgiven and still headed home to heaven is all that matters to us. If we are to die before seeing the eastern sky open wide, so be it. And at the same time, if we are to stand alive and in that perfect number to see it all happen then, so be it as well. My obvious point for the sermon is to illustrate how strong Christians truly are and how weak Satan actually is. For even if we sin, it's not going to change our stand in Christ as long as we properly confess that sin. What happens to us because of our sin bears no weight at all upon the task at hand anymore. Yeah, we still might get spanked, but we're still going to do the work and it's still going to be just as blessed because we've done what he said to do when it comes to confession and repentance. Satan knows that. And so he builds on the sin to try to make our next step in Christ falter. But learn a lesson from the believers of old who served other gods and were now in desperate need of the Lord's deliverance, just as we are every time we sin. Notice what's shared in Judges, chapter 10, verses 13 to 16. It says, Yet ye have forsaken me, and served other gods. Wherefore I will deliver you no more. Go, cry unto the gods, which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee this day. So stopping there for a moment, they realize, okay, the spanking's coming, so be it. Do unto us what you think is right, because we trust you. But deliver us, we still want to go home. Right? That's what deliverance means. And they put away, it says, it goes on, it says, And they put away the strange gods from among them, and served the Lord, and his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. So, and because the Lord's heart was grieved, they were most assuredly, but delivered, just as all of us were delivered when we met Christ Jesus on day one, and have been delivered many times after that whenever we stepped off the path. And so, for those of you that feel you're not worthy to cry out to him or even declare him Lord and Savior in the truest sense of that word, Isaiah 44:22 reminds us that I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Returneth unto me, for I have redeemed thee, just as much as it is your duty to confess your sins, it is also your duty to believe once confessed they are forgiven. And this concludes the sins you commit tomorrow. But this is not to say you now have a license to sin. God forbid, because he's not mocked. You cannot plan to sin knowing he's a forgiving God. I mean, that's how the world dictates, via Roman Catholicism, for example, who declare you can be saved while still in your sins. But the truth is, you are saved from your sins. As the Christian who has walked a few miles with Jesus knows, the sins of the past are not only gone, they are no longer part of the issue in our spiritual life. It's when the Holy Spirit reveals some small and even big things onto us you know, day by day, and it helps us to fine-tune our character so as to burn off all that dross, so as to be ready for that latter rain. That is why it says what it says in 1 John 1.10, which is, that if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So many, like the Baptists, who preach, once saved, always saved, believe that once you confess the whoppers that you did before you meet, uh, met Christ, that you never sin anymore, ever, ever again, for the rest of your life, and therefore never able to lose out on heaven. Well, if that were true, how is it possible to grow in Christ, to become strong enough to help others find him at all? When all you do is you stay a babe from that point forward. I mean, if all you do is skate through life thinking you're perfect on day one, how is the Lord ever going to be able to use you? You're never growing. You're never going to come to a uh, realization uh, how to share your faith with others either. You're just worried about the skin on your own teeth because that's the only way you think you're going to get it anyway. I mean, when we came to him, we put down the old sins. But as we walk and grow in Christ, he awakens us to areas we never knew were sinful. And so we once again confess and repent of such things so as to be blessed even more. And this is why that friend of mine I was talking about earlier used to think that my doctrines were changing. He says, no, 
The Lord has given me more truth as I go. I started out as a Catholic. Then I then I became and I left the Catholic Church and I started out as an evangelistic Sunday keeper. And over the years, he he got me to quit smoking and drinking and swearing and well, the swearing actually happened day one. But the thing was, all the things that stopped and then eventually got to a point where ten years after leaving the Roman Catholic Church, my wife and I started keeping Sabbath, and in then even more truth started coming. But here now, it's just new light upon all all the truth that's already been written. And yes, sometimes these little sinful idiosyncrasies can be a tad difficult to uh, overcome for us. And so we may end up doing them then and, you know, then and uh, again and again in the coming days. But for the most part, such things are not planned. And we all know about what Jesus said about forgiving 70 times 77. If he knows you're honestly trying your best, and you're not just saying, oh, I'm just going to do this anyway because he's going to forgive me anyway. No, 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 that's not what he was talking about when he was talking to Peter about forgiving somebody that has sinned against you seven times. You forgive them seven times or 70 times or 77 times, 77 times. Because he's going to do it that way. But it has to be legit. It has to be real for you. You can't just plan to sin. Because if that's the way you think, then you may as well print a banner of Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1 and hang it over your head. Satan tempts us. At, now, here's, the, here's a, lot of, a lot of Christians miss this because, like I was saying, most for the most part, such things like these little idiosyncrasies that we have uh, that even though we don't want to do them, we might do them once every other year or something like that, uh, whatever the case may be. It could be once every other month. It doesn't matter. It's They're never planned is what I'm getting at. And what I'm trying to explain here, it's just like uh, Satan tempts us at the exact moment when he knows you're weak. And so the sin that you thought you overcome comes forth like a knee-jerk reaction to someone or something pushing your buttons. So again, confess and repent. Remember, after doing so, that there's no need to go around mourning and constantly repenting under a cloud of continual you know, self-condemnation and despair. You learned a lesson in how weak you are. Praise God that you realize you still have to try harder because you messed up again. But you're forgiven. So walk in greater truth now. I can recall how the Lord revealed to me when, uh, when I asked him... Um, to forgive me of, of any sin in my past, that even if he needs to spank me, at least he won't remove his Holy Spirit from me. And that means my faith grows, knowing that no matter what he decides or what seemeth good for him to do to me, it is going to be for my benefit anyway. And therefore, I can get back to the work as if I never sinned in the first place. Because First John 1, verses 8 and 9 says, If we say we have that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And to, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then Micah chapter 7, verses 18 and 19 said earlier, He retaineth not his anger forever. And he cast all those sins into the depths of the sea. So again, get back to work. And remember, you can stand just as strong on this day as you did the very day you met Christ and received a brand new heart. Only now, you have a lot more truth to run with. In fact, Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 7 says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And then Psalm thirty four eighteen says, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. And we talked about that before as well. Contrite spirit being that you know what you did is wrong, and it really tears you up. I mean, real sorrow for sin. Uh, that you commit is the fruit and evidence of the Holy Spirit in the heart of God's people. And this is how he moves us to confess and repent in the first place. He reveals to each of us how he, we grieve him. And that, that sparks the contrition that brings us back to Calvary to realize how much he loved us when he died for us. And we see him there on the cross. We grieve for the sins we committed against him. And that type of sorrow leads us to a um, point where we loathe the sin and our walk is perfected even more. And none of this would be possible without the perfect love of Jesus Christ that came upon us on day one. I mean, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I mean, seriously, can you grasp that and what that means? 6,000 years ago. Check this out. 6,000 years ago, when he created this planet and he breathed the life into Adam, he was the same then as he is today. When he split the Red Sea so Moses and the people of God could escape the safety 
And now we have scientific evidence to prove that happened. There's even chariot wheels down there on the, under the water. He was the same then as he is now. When he gave those dreams to Daniel about the end that is racing towards us today, just over 2,500 years ago, he was the same then as he is today. When he died and resurrected to put an end to sin and it literally defeated death 2,000 years ago, he was the same then as he is now. And when he answered your prayer to save you last week, last year, or decades ago, he was the same then as he is this Sabbath day. Mankind who lives in linear time, you know, past, present, and future, and, and he only does this for a short period of time, we change on a regular basis, as we know. I mean, look, just look at fashion, if you want to see what I'm talking about there, right? But that's all just a smokescreen from the pits of hell to make us all believe that Jesus, who resides in eternity, he changes as well. Well, not according to the Bible. The Apostle Paul said 2,000 years ago in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is and always will be the same yesterday, today, and forever. And since he never changes, and I'll close with this, since he never changes, nor does he change a single verse in his Holy Bible, even though mankind keeps doing it, or even a single word in any of the promises found in that Holy Writ, the latter rain that is promised to fall upon his obedient people is going to happen just as all the other prophetic events came to fulfillment to the letter last week, last year, last decade. And so we must have the same faith as Adam, Moses, Daniel, or any of the apostles that saw how Jesus was the same throughout all the ages whenever they met him. That's why he's called the desire of ages. So the next time you go to the throne of Christ with a desire in your heart to do something that you know will glorify him before the people, that he sends you away all the time, trust him to answer that prayer as if you prayed it 6,000 years ago in creation week, long before sin entered into the world. Because if you have confessed and repented of all your sins that you know of, then your voice will be heard by Jesus just as clearly as Adam listened to that sweet and lovely voice when Jesus walked with him in that garden in the cool of the day. Hope and pray that you were blessed by what was shared the Sabbath day.